All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. We see that um, a few more people are still joining. So we'll give them a few more seconds to join in and um, then we can begin. All right, seems like enough people have joined already. So by the time everyone starts joining the session, I'd like you to uh, I'd like to run you through a few housekeeping items for this webinar. So firstly, we'll start with the presentation. The presentation uh, would be for around uh, 30 minutes, and that will be followed by a Q&A session for the next half an hour of this, uh, of this webinar. Um, please use the Q&A section on your Zoom screens in order to ask the questions. Uh, we'll take as many questions as possible towards the end. So throughout the webinar, I encourage you to please um, keep um, keep sending us your questions. Um, we won't be using the raise hand feature on Zoom, unfortunately, that you might see on your screen. So I would suggest that if you have anything uh, to comment or to ask, uh, just use the, use the question and answering um, um, section of Zoom, right? Uh, the session will be recorded, so we'll be sending you a nice uh, recording at the end of every session. So for all the attendees, for you to reference uh, when you have time later. Uh, and at the end of the webinar, we'll also send you a small survey. So that helps us keep on improving um, things for upcoming webinars as well. Right. Great. So just a little bit about who you would see today. So my name is Parikshit or Pari. I am the senior demand gen manager here at DeepSet. Um, DeepSet, as you know, is a company that helps enterprises build NLP power solutions. We do that with the help of our uh, enterprise product, DeepSet Cloud. But we are also the company behind the very famous um, Haystack NLP framework, which is kind of the de facto standard for building a API-driven NLP today, right? Um, and today we have joining us Milos Rusik. Um, Milos is the CEO. Hello there, Milos. Milos is the CEO and one of our co-founders. Um, he has enormous experience and insights on some of the challenges that enterprises face today uh, with, uh, with NLP in production. So Milos, um, glad to have you here and uh, I'd like to hand over the stage to you. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Let me now take over the screen and then I'm happy to get started. And I expect everyone sees my screen. Yeah, it Excellent. looks great. Great, cool. Then, hi everyone. Also from my side, um, excited to uh, to um, to share a bit more about uh, about our experiences and to talk a bit more about NLP and how to enable it in applications and, of course, also in particular in enterprise applications. Uh, briefly, what to expect in the webinar. I will briefly touch the state of NLP. So this means where are we from a technological standpoint, but also how does today the building of NLP applications actually work? We'll then dive a bit into the challenges of building NLP applications and solutions, but of course not without also mentioning ways out and at least an idea about the solutions. And then I will illustrate this a bit alongside a case study. And then I'm really looking forward to um, two questions actually. So please, um, yeah, as Pari mentioned, just type them in um looking forward to 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 some kind of a discussion maybe even so let's start with the state of nlp briefly and i think nlp is something i mean nlp llms bird transformer models all of these terms are pretty much around there's a lot of hype and a lot of buzz these days around nlp and the question is a bit where does this excitement and this interest actually come from so i think the first reason is NLP actually works um, and it is really also usable today. I would argue that probably a few years ago, this wasn't the case. It worked only in very special situations and maybe with a lot of effort, but this is a great it's an, a, actually advancement of today's NLP that it is, it is ready to be used. The second thing is we can adjust NLP models and solutions 
to our individual use cases and individual data. If it is certain abbreviations or special terminologies that a use case contains, contains it is very, there are very effective strategies in making it actually work also in these use cases. And the last thing is it's immediately available. So um, we have many great open source sources to access, for example, models like Hugging Face, many APIs out there, also frameworks like, like Haystack that combine models with, with, uh, with all other components are in place. And this ultimately drives not just the interest, but also the general adoption of NLP um, among cycle companies and enterprises. What are now the, the problems or the, the, yeah, the, the cases where NLP is applied to, especially in enterprise setups? One big, one big, so to say family or one big, um, one big field of application is definitely everything around document or data processing. Huh? For example, in financial services, when you think about risk management processes where analysts are making conclusions based on a lot of data that is available to them or documents, for example, a credit scoring decision or maybe an investment decision. And when it's about, it's when it's for them about to extract the key information from a large amount of data and documents they have from a particular company. For example, when it's about, I don't know, questions like, how high was the revenue? How did profitability involve? What are core risks this company is exposed to? All of this can be now pre-processed and make it be made available to analysts to finally improve and also be faster in their decision-making. Another big family of applications is in the whole space of search and knowledge management. Um, companies and organizations have spent big efforts over the past years to somehow, on the one hand, consolidate all their data and knowledge in the enterprises they have. On the other hand, there was a big adoption of tools, wiki tools, knowledge management tools that should help organizations to conserve and somehow you know, have all of that knowledge in one place. Now, the next logical step is not just to have data and the knowledge available, but to make it actually accessible, for example, in technical domains or manufacturing where you have i don't know a lot of technical handbooks best practices maybe even past troubleshooting reports and you want to enable people who work in engineering or maintenance to really quickly fix problems and find answers to questions like how to fix a turbine failure what to do when i get an error of 404 how to change my password all of these things and the last Big field of application are virtual assistants. Chatbots are around for quite some time. Um, we have seen them already in production. Modern NLP empowers us in the end to, uh, to only improve their capabilities, to make them capable to answer even more questions on even more data and more knowledge bases, such that, for example, in retail or banking applications, we can build now bots that really find all answers to questions like, I don't know, um, what is the cancellation period? Um, how long does it take until I receive my delivery? Um, or I don't know, what is my credit card limit? So who is now or who are these persons and these stakeholders in the end who are involved and ultimately who are building these NLP applications and these NLP use cases, right? And in the end, NLP is always a part of a product. This means in the middle, there is, of course, someone who has to own this product in shipping, but of course, also in um, the requirements and in, let's say, the product market fit, if you want to say so. So one core stakeholder in here are definitely the business lines. This means those people who gain the value out of the application that is part with NLP and who are ultimately also the users of the NLP application. Business lines usually need to explore the capabilities of NLP before anything has been started, you know? So they really have to see, does it work? Does it work for me? Is the information I can expect from this NLP model or this NLP solution actually at all useful to how I work and to what I, I want to achieve with it? And the second important aspect of the business lines is that 
the whole development process should be closely aligned with them and they should be involved in actually each step of the building not just of the whole product but especially also of the nlp capabilities in order to really make sure that what is built there is really in line with the needs and is therefore really ultimately also contributing um, and delivering the value that is expected on the other side we have those teams who are actually implementing this product based on the requirements of so the engineering teams and here we have to make a distinction on the one hand we have of course those teams who are responsible for the full product where nlp is a part of and then there are the machine learning and data science teams who are mostly responsible for the model part of nlp now their challenge with the engineering teams is mostly to actually make use of nlp models and really make them part of a full application and the second thing is as we said business users need to be involved throughout the whole process on the other side of the coin engineering needs to benchmark continuously if the needs of their end users are actually met and if what they are building on the nlp side also really is still improving and going into the direction the business line can work with it and gets value out of it and ultimately in the middle lucky unlucky position as you see it uh, the product owner so someone who has to translate these requirements and in the end also make them part of a product so being responsible not just for development and implementation but ultimately also of the final adoption of nlp within the enterprise and by the end users so you can imagine probably that in this constellation um, and in the building process there are there are often many challenges many 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 questions that arise and one of the of the big challenges and 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 problems that engineering teams usually face especially data science teams before they get started is how do we actually get to a model at all how do we how can we make it possible to have some nlp model that works for us and usually the belief is that we need first to care a lot about data and train a lot to generate a lot of training data and then train models ultimately but the reality is that we can get started right away without the need of any training and we can actually start to utilize pre-trained models that are out there so companies like google microsoft openai they work on actually creating models and these models are today very accessible huh? either they're open sourced for example on the hugging face model hub we can actually access all state-of-the-art models or they're accessible via apis for example from openai or cohere now we have an easy access yeah, to these models and this is already what can be maybe even enough for our business application to be served and it's in every case a very very good starting point to actually get started without having the need to first create training data and start with thinking about training and all of that procedure second thing is that the whole product teams product owners and engineering teams have to think about the full nlp piece of their product really in terms of an application we just talked about models and when you think about an application that should allow users to search with questions so to say google-based search experiences on their individual data then i think it's quite obvious that with just an nlp model you actually cannot really serve this application right so on the one hand you will need in every case an application software that is accessible to the end user where they type in the search query you will need in every case of course the data but also in between there is much more than just one model so you will always need to pre-process the data where the search should be performed on right and once it's pre-processed you want that this data is somewhere stored in this pre-processed format such that it is exact accept uh, accessible to the models and then you usually will have an application that is probably a bit more nuanced and you won't just need one model but probably you will need two models so in this case 
probably something that is a retrieval model that filters out the most relevant information from this NLP storage. And then ultimately, of course, a model on top of it that answers the questions and really finds in these text snippets the exact answer to the question made. And this makes it a full application, or as we call it, a pipeline. The last part is there is a certain way um, and process how NLP products and applications should be developed. And there is a life cycle that should be applied in order to successfully do this. Now, we talked just a few seconds ago, actually, that the starting point is probably not the model, but the pipeline. This means, first of all, we have to think about what is this pipeline that is solving the problem and that is ultimately providing the NLP functionality into my product. What we have to do then is we, of course, prepare this pipeline and then starts the moment when we start to choose models and we pick models. And now we also learned that these models, we don't have to invent them from scratch, but there's a lot of pre-trained models that are available. So we start or we actually continue with evaluating first the quality of these models. And how do we do this? We go two streams. The one thing is probably how traditionally you would approach that problem of evaluation, machine learning by creating evaluation and test data. And then you run the models against it, your pipeline against it, and see how it, which results it yields. But on the other hand, it's very important to, in this step, already have also this end user feedback, this business line feedback and involvement that we were talking about earlier. And based on this evaluation, we can then figure out if fine tuning or let's say training and tuning it to our individual data is necessary at all. And if so, this feedback and this evaluation can help us to derive a very effective strategy to fine tune. For example, if we figure out, hey, the pipeline performs very poorly on certain terms or in specific abbreviations, um, then we can derive a strategy and focus the generation of training data and fine tuning explicitly around these terms or abbreviations, such that we have a very effective strategy to, um, to a fully production ready system and pipeline. And ultimately, this is what we have to deploy, continuously monitor as information needs change, as data changes, and probably we will walk through this process over and over again as things are changing. Um, let me briefly illustrate a little bit of this uh, on, a, on, a, on a brief case study. This is a bank we are having here who has a big IT knowledge management database. Um, so a wiki where actually a lot of principles, how to develop software, um, how to in this case, store logs, for example, how this should look like. And the value they wanted to get out of, um, of NLP and of the product they built is actually that they wanted to allow not just fast, but also very extensive insights for their IT professionals in the company um, into all documents and guidelines and best practices that were around in that bank. So the business application they wanted to build was actually, they said, we need uh, an intelligent search function that is built inside of our internal company, Wiki. Technically, this is solved with a semantic search pipeline with question answering. And all of this has to happen over a very large uh, knowledge base of text data. On the right-hand side, you see a little bit of how this can look like. So you get a question like, how long should I store logs? Then you see how they find the answers in the policies over here, in this case, 90 days. Now, what was the approach? So as mentioned earlier, the first step was design the pipeline and build it. In this case, as it's question answering, it was a scalable question answering pipeline, so-called retriever reader pipeline with metadata filtering, because um, there were certain subjects and topics where users wanted actually to limit the space they're asking the question into. What happened then was, based on end users feedback and, um, and a theoretical evaluation. Um, Pre-trained models have been evaluated. In this case, you see the, the end user feedback with a 79% accuracy. 
almost 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 80 accuracy means in this case the first answer that has been given was useful to the end user the company felt like this can be probably improved a little bit uh, so this was why um why they felt it's worth probably doing some fine tuning and then where we saw flaws in this initial pipeline where the end user feedback wasn't so good um, the input has been taken and a very a very specific fine tuning strategy has been uh, has been performed uh, it was mostly around around certain specific um, abbreviations that were quite company specific so not not things that are probably also on wikipedia and that can be can be used in a fine trained in a, in, in a pre-trained model but there was a need to to really add some some specific terminology and it was approximately a thousand labels i'm not sure about the exact number now um, and it was like a low effort to uh, took four days in the end um, to to generate these labels fine-tune a model and then end up with, with almost 90 percent 89 percent in that case accuracy so uh, we saw a strong improvement towards the 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 um how many of the first responses from the pipeline were actually useful and that was the moment when um when a launch uh, happened uh, with let's say a more selective set of users so that's a bank with uh, more than 10,000 internal users on this wiki and the first step was to to launch it um, for the first 200 users. That being said, um, the presentation part is uh, is through for now. I hope this was uh, somewhat insightful and useful and I hope uh, we have uh, we have many questions and uh, yeah looking looking forward to answer uh, to answer those uh, hopefully all of them. <laughs> Yeah, we have a bunch of questions coming in. So um, I have one over here mm -hmm. from uh, Malta. So Malta is asking us, um, do you have examples of real-time application, that is speech-to-speech -speech translations of NLP? Are models and open source frameworks already capable of real-time applications? Mm -hmm. Of speech-to-speech? -speech, um, was it speech-to-speech -speech in particular? That um, speech to speech translations, I think that's what he mentioned. Okay, okay. <laughs> so look, I think um, so. What I can say is, are NLP applications in real time possible? Um, yes. Uh, actually, actually, we know one company, I'm not sure if I can mention them already, who went into production just yesterday um, on a large scale search system in their product. Many end users, more than, more than 30 million documents um, in there. So, Yes, it is possible. For the particular case of speech to speech translation, I can imagine what the use case is. The challenge is probably the transcription of the of the speech in the first step. And I know that this is quite compute intensive. So my answer, without now knowing it and without honestly being a super expert now in that case, my answer would be: I think it's possible. I think the I think it's a bit of a uh, compute computes expensive tasks probably to go for but um simply from the capabilities i mean translation is extremely mature in nlp yeah? speech to text is as well and also actually from text to speech we saw seen great improvements so from a pure from a pure performance standpoint of the capabilities um for sure possible from scaling it up for sure possible i simply think it's a bit of a matter of resources um uh, in, in in that case yeah? That's awesome. I hope that answered your question, Malta. Um, I'll move on to the other one. I think we have more questions uh, coming in now. So please keep it going, uh, people. So we'll try to take as many as possible. Um, so Moritz has a question. So he says, you showed three groups. One is the data science team. The second is the product owner. And the third is the business. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, which organization does the product owner normally belong to? DeepSet or the business client? That's an excellent, uh, excellent question. The product owner is usually uh, on on company side. So this means we see product owners actually in in I mean enterprises are usually structured in um, IT IT teams are usually so called shared teams that are often assigned to certain business lines. Let's say to um, to uh, to the accounting department, for example, and then they are responsible for the application building for these departments. 
And then you always have these product owners inside the customers, clients, organizations, so to say. So speaking about deep set app will be the client. Speaking about you as an enterprise within your own organization, this is where these product owners are. And they can either be part of the centralized IT or maybe even on the business line, someone who's solely responsible for that. We've seen it all. We even seen two persons with that product owner role, to be honest, the one who is really responsible for the requirement side, the other one for the implementation side. If you would look into, so your name is Moritz. I, I, I assume that uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're a German native speaker. Um, so um, you, you probably know a world where uh, in Germany it was quite common. It still is probably in some companies where you had uh, Lastenhefte and Pflichtenhefte, um, which is usually like business requirements and the actual implementation of it. And we've also seen this, but to answer, to, to, make, to make a crisp answer, product owners are always present within the organizations, uh, enterprises, um, and also, of course, product building companies. If you think about Spotify or something like them, there's a product online in place responsible for, let's say, I don't know, podcast search or whatever. Yeah. That's awesome. So we have another question from Christopher now. So Christopher firstly says, thanks for the great presentation. So I'm glad that you enjoyed Christopher. Um, so he says, I see a problem in one of the very first steps when it comes to consolidating the data from the most different formats and storage solutions. For example, like Confluence, SharePoint, other wiki tools and many more things like that yeah. and make it retrievable for all the models. So how do you typically handle this kind of a situation? Um, <clears throat> That's, uh, that's exactly, I'm going back to the slide. This is exactly this point here. Pre-processing is a very crucial part in your NLP pipeline because um, so honestly, in the end, getting the data out of these systems is probably somewhat possible, right? I mean, a conference system has an API you can call and then you get, for example, I don't know, a JSON file out or you take something from SharePoints, PDFs, whatever. And then you have, so these are actually many, many steps. Huh? Um, then you have a conversion, right? So convert this file into plain TXT, right? Because this is in the end what we need over here. Um, and then finally, um, I'm not sure how deep you are into it. You simply cannot throw a full document or a full TXT on it. You need to chunk it and to split it. And then you need a separate index. So um, all right, how we solve it is we focused a lot in... Um, in Haystack, actually, uh, on, on these steps. So the whole pre-processing procedures, the way to send raw files, upload them via the upload API, and the whole path from raw file format into the NLP storage, so to say, into the database, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, dedicated vector databases. All of this is, is, is covered. Um, so if you're interested in more technical um, details about how these pipelines look like and which steps are in there and which technology choices can be made, then um, probably probably it's helpful to look into the Haystack documentation for sure. But yeah, it is it is essential and a crucial part. And um, and um, yeah, our products are pretty much also focused on this indexing piece, as we call it, because it's it's very it's very essential to um, to to take a lot of pain away from it. Um, in, order to, in order to really have a scalable pipeline. Yeah. Got it. So I have a very interesting question here. So it's a little bit of, a, of an application question now. So, um, so Carlos is asking, can you describe some creative use cases that have solved business problems using NLP? So he also says that I've noticed that NLP has been focused either in search for similar sentences, summarization, or to try to answer a question that is, um, I try to find an answer for a particular question. Um, so all that functionality is fantastic, but he's curious about uh, what other creative tasks can be accomplished using NLP. So I'm not sure what creative tasks means here, but I'm assuming it is like what other use cases there are, or you know, some yeah, something yeah. like that. So if, if it's I, I just wanted to ask. But so it, it was good. It was good that Carlos already mentioned some some tasks that uh, that so so that he's limiting the space. Yeah. I think um, I think what is uh, what is probably exciting is um, is um, question generation. Maybe yeah, I'm not sure. I think this is actually a nice one. So, and um, in in all things education, we know we know actually many many big fans of the question generation module in our community. For example, there are many startups, but also enterprises who actually look at question generation. It means you give a you give in a knowledge base, and based on that this 
questions are generated and what you can do for example you can use it for corporate training right you can you can use these generated questions you can be somewhat sure that they are answerable yeah, within 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 this document base and then you can for example in education programs you know automate tests you can maybe even create very individual individual um education tests you know in order to see i don't know let's say you have a developer who's really responsible for a niche area you don't want to set up um and on training and especially like training and evaluation right if such a developer can see oh did my training work did i succeed so in that in that sense it's it's very effective to use nlp to even take very niche domains and not to have the effort of setting up a training and multiple choice uh, question question questionnaire so to say but you can simply pull it through a pipeline and you can give very very detailed um very detailed very detailed tests for example um where where people can can um can actually evaluate and confirm um uh, uh, their learnings and their knowledge yeah? i hope this was somewhat creative <laughs> yeah um yeah so we have more questions coming in so uh which one do i take let me see mm. Okay, this is an interesting one. Um, Mumtaz asks, um, thanks for the presentation. How do you generate or find the data for fine tuning, especially for domain specific data where the data is sparse or it could be a startup case that lacks data for fine tuning it and tries to apply NLP for its, serv uh, for its services. So how do, we, how do we generate and find data for, for fine tuning? So in enterprise setups, usually you want to fine tune on on proprietary data, right? Um, and this is then this is then your chance to, of course, utilize your own data in fine tuning. Yeah, you can do this, of course, unsupervised by fine tuning or domain adapting the language model, and then you can create, for example, labeled data on this proprietary data. If you now think about a certain, let's say, you want to build a product to serve a domain. Let's say you want to build a Let's say you want to build a search engine for um, for oh, aerospace manufacturing. <laughs> yeah. Um, in that case, you want to build a product, and probably you don't have really access to the proprietary data of aerospace companies, of Airbus, SpaceX, uh, Boeing, whatever. Right. In that moment, mm -hmm. you somehow need to bridge it. Um, I would say it depends a bit on what you're building exactly, where you can get it from, but. You will be surprised. Um, you will be surprised how much high quality data is around that can be used. That can be also applied. So that can be used for fine tuning, and the resulting pipelines can be used on very proprietary data. And you will see a very good effect. I was talking about abbreviations earlier. If you have very corporate specific language, you usually cannot get around a little bit of of, of fine tuning on that data. But if you will think about domains like aerospace, legal, if you think about healthcare, there's a lot of data around. You can, I don't know, you can, you can, you can go to the NHS website and, for example, take all their reports. I think it's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's actually allowed to to use them. For example, for machine learning models, <clears throat> you can you can look into papers um, from the healthcare domain, and you know there there are many many opportunities to get that data for fine tuning. Um, but yeah, but of course, uh, if 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 it's if it's very specific and you are an outsider, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to say, um, it's yeah for the last mile, it's it's still usually a bit a bit challenging, I guess. Uh, but if you if you have a specific domain you want to fine tune for, uh, you can also and you, if you don't want to share it right now, you can also drop um, drop me a, uh, drop me a mail or write us, and maybe we can direct you to some to some to some data sources. We've seen. We've seen a lot of sources and we tried a lot around and played a lot around. So potentially we can we can really be very, very specific and very, very maybe we can help you here. So happy, happy to do so if you want to write us a mail. Yeah. yeah. And actually we'll share a way for you guys to um, to tell us about your use cases. So if you have any specific questions for your enterprise projects, so happy to help you guys there as well. So um, we'll just let you know in a, in a little bit how to do that. Um, there's another interesting question here from Renato. It says, um, I've had the experience that company documentation also consists often of PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. And the nature of the slides is that they are composed of images and text. 
Um, the second part of the question, I don't understand exactly. Is there any plan of offering mixed models yeah. that, for yeah. instance, transcribe images to text to improve retrieval? I think I know. And uh, I, yeah. I, okay, okay, cool. I got it. I got it. It's all good. Um, so yes, you have multimodal. Uh, you have uh, the opportunity to do multi multimodal search. Um, uh, it's it's possible. Um, uh, or yeah, multimodal retrieval. Um, I think. I don't know if anyone is here from from DeepSet uh, Haystack team. I think it's part of the next release in Haystack. In every case, so we talked just about multimodal retrieval today. So yes, it's possible. Um, and you don't you even don't need necessarily to do a, a, like auto captioning. I think this is where you're coming from, which is a, a very a very smart idea yeah, to to take the image and to auto caption it or get an auto description from it and then search for that description. Um, you can you you really have these multi-modal models and ways to do it, and so that's possible. And um, there are some models around. And as mentioned, I think I think if you yeah we can we will probably publish something soon, and probably also a bit of content around that. So you can maybe yeah you can in every case follow Haystack for this and and have a look. So it's possible. Uh, just adding one one speciality here to this particular case because we know that case also quite well. Um, you often have in PowerPoints graphs, <laughs> which which adds a bit of more complexity because you might want to have, let's say, you have a bar chart, uh, and then you see the growth rate, yeah, uh, twelve percent, fifteen percent, um, and you are interested in the growth rate and you want to read it out as a structured as a structured date, so to say, out of this out of this graph. This is very complex. I think the multimodal models are not yet there to really do this reliably, just to frame it. But if it's just an image, I don't know if you say like, I don't know, I'm interested in graphs talking about revenue evolution or something like this, and you want to retrieve them, I think that that that's fairly possible already. Huh? And yes, should be supported in Haystack soon. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so I think a, a very, uh, a more general question actually right now. So where do you see the most potential for NLP adoption going into 2023? Space, where I see most adoption? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> the space where I see most adoption for NLP in 2023. Um, it's hard because I think I expect a lot of adoption in 2023 for, for, for NLP. So where do I think is is um, is the biggest, the biggest, the biggest one? Look, I think um i think you know everywhere where information is key right when you think about right. manufacturing information is relevant mm -hmm. but there are industries where information is really key right and i think um and i think uh i think this is gonna be very big for example in financial services uh, where 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 it's actually more more or less almost exclusively around information I think a lot about um, healthcare, you know, biomedical, where it's also a lot about information, consolidating information. I think these will be spaces that will that will um, that will adopt very broadly NLP in 2023. And I would also expect that every one of us as consumers, we're gonna get in touch with way more NLP if it is on FAQ pages when you look for an answer, um, if it is website search, if it is product search, maybe even uh, on any e-commerce portal, you know what I mean? I would expect that uh, we will we will see this even more and we as end users will experience it also in these in these areas and domains um, a lot in the next year because yeah, we had some breakthrough, we have some buzz, we have some trust also because things work. Uh, we, for example, know of many Haystack users who have, for example, Haystack implemented into their websites as well and into their FAQs and, um, and, um, and documentations. And I think you know having this experience will just raise the appetite <laughs> for more and more spaces and and industries uh, to to adopt it. So uh, um, all over the place, but I think information intense industries and probably also consumer facing um, mm -hmm. applications will will see a big big adoption. Awesome. So we have another question coming in. This is about um, multilingual data. So mm -hmm. Sumit is asking. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had the opportunity to work with multilingual multilingual data in case of question answering pipeline? Yeah. And if yes, can you share some of the challenges that you faced and the insights that you got from it? Yeah. Um, so yes, we did. It's 
it always depends on which language to say it right away. Yeah? Um, because uh, so <clears throat> from our experience, I mean, we worked we worked on on multilingual use cases, for example, um, German, English, French uh, needed to, to be supported. Um, we have right now uh, some users who work on, on Korean language. And for for these languages, uh, you have uh, the models need. So you have two options to go. Option one is you go for a multilingual model, for example, XLM Roberta, which is quite well performing already. I think as a as a starting point, it's a it's it's a good way to start, and you will be probably quite pleased how good it is. And then you always have the option to take for each to take to branch it out, so to say. This is now something that is in Haystack, for example, possible that you detect the language or classify the language and then branch into, let's say, a German pipeline or a German model, an English model, a Korean model, that's also possible. Yeah? Um, adds a bit more complexity. It can be that the language specific models are A, either better in their responses or B, are easier to scale because um, multilingual models are very, very large. Uh, and it's a bit of a challenge probably to keep the latency low and deploy that if you want to deploy it yourself. I would say this is probably a very, a very big challenge here. And you know, I would say other than that, if you think about this evaluation life cycle I showed you, um, you need to make sure that you have uh, end users who you know can test then each and every language, right? So um, you really need people who can do this and can be take part in that in that step. Um, so if you think about building something and opening it simply to a broad range of people, um, you know, entering a market without really testing it before, that might be a challenge. So make sure that you evaluate it then also with someone who potentially you know. Um, can be an end user for you or who you know who can evaluate the quality of your pipeline on on this on the particular languages you want to use it at uh, otherwise it's a bit risky probably yeah. mm -hmm. got it um there's another question from moritz this time it's uh, it's about deep set as a company mm -hmm. so he wants to know a little bit more about um how many people are working on like open source tools how many of us are working on like consulting or with clients and are we commercializing Haystack or are we doing some kind of like an enterprise solution? So I think that's, that's pretty much like what, what is our product offering basically, so. Okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, happy to briefly go, 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 go over this. Um, um, I, I hope it was, yeah, it wasn't the intention, right? <laughs> a marketing yeah. presentation, but at the core of what we do is this Haystack. Um, uh, that's, that's right, that's our, our open source model, our open source model, our open source framework. What we, um, what we uh, what we offer around it is called DeepSet Cloud, which is a platform to build Haystack applications. Uh, this means it is um, it supports many of the workflows that we've seen, right? So from um, demoing fast and sharing a demo to actually running experimentations, running end user tests, um, kind of A/B tests with different pipelines and configurations, to fine tuning, to deploying, to monitoring. This is what happens on DeepSet Cloud. And this is something where we support our customers um, with uh, with the building process, of course, not in a consulting style, though we do not offer any services or consulting work anymore because this is uh, we started differently as a company um, uh, a few years ago and, and made many relevant learnings from that process of you know being a professional services company and building custom NLP applications. And out of these learnings, we created our product. Uh, this is how we came up with Haystack as something that is not just a model, but the full stack, because we learned, oh, the models are around, but how can we utilize them? There's a lot of headache. And we heard now questions around pre-processing. Oh, we should take that away. We should make that easier. This was the idea for Haystack. And the idea for DeepSec Cloud was then pretty much when building with Haystack, oh, it's hard to do these experiments. Oh, we need end user feedback. Well, we need a streamlined way to fine tune. Um, oof, we need a platform for that because that's so hard. And this is how we came up with DeepSec Cloud. Um, but again, we're have a we have an we have a solutions team, all NLP engineers who then help our um, our customers um, on DeepSec Cloud to 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 walk through the process. And then we have um, the DevRel team and also actually a solutions team who help also our community very closely to succeed and to run through these processes. So when you're an Haystack open source user. You will also always have, have have access to our people. We have a we have a Discord channel. We have the GitHub repository. 
we try to be as responsive as it gets to to help also people who are using the open source framework to to really succeed and you know to 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 uh, to walk through through this NLP lifecycle somehow. So on both okay. ends, we are very supportive. There's a commercial offering, but also on the community side, we invest a lot and care a lot about about making community members successful. Yeah. Awesome. So there's uh, there's a question by Felipe. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, this, is there any real use case for QA using generative answering text or image? If so, how to deal with the uh, hallucination issue? I'm not sure I quite understand what a hallucination issue is though. Mm, let me answer I'm, I'm, um, how, how I understand it. So um, <clears throat> I, think, I think one problem with generative QA is in general that you have two ways of doing it. You have models that have been trained and then you pose a question and then you get an answer. Now, the answer you get out of these models is usually an answer that can only be right if the model has been trained on the fact. I'll give you one example. If I would ask um, the model about what is my last name <laughs> uh, or what is the last name of, uh, the, one of the CEO of, of DeepSet, um, then the answer can only be right if um, if it's uh, if it has been trained on any document where my name appeared in this context, right? And that's usually a bit of a challenge because um, what if this is not the case? Because for example, you have proprietary private data, yeah? um, and also then how to how to induce this knowledge? And this is where retrieval augmented generation comes into play. This means. Um, this means the generation of the answer doesn't happen, so to say, out of the model per se, but you hand over the question, you hand over a document where this fact is in. For example, I hand over the, I don't know, the company presentation of DeepSet, and then the model extracts the answer and generates it out of it, so to say. Yeah? And uh, this, is, this is doable and this, this works. It's uh, not so essential, I would say, in many use cases. We see it's usually for something where you want a very, um, a very human way of, or a very human feel, you know. So um, we know that in chatbots, it's it's a thing that people think about generative answers mm, because it's interesting to, to you know, the generative answers are usually more, sound more human a bit, right? If you can add a little bit of Collaboration, LFQA is, for example, one one such thing. Also, um, it it simply adds a different flavor compared to you simply extract maybe a very formal sentence out of the terms and conditions. If someone asks, "Am I insured? There was a hailstorm yesterday. Is my car insured?" and then you get an answer like, um, uh, "Natural disasters are insured up to one million." Sounds a bit unnatural. And with generation, usually the hope is to make it a bit more human. Like I don't know. Yes, it is insured up to this amount, or as it is a natural disaster, you are insured, or things like this. This is a bit the hope from the uh, generative one. Other than that, it's not essential to have these to have these um, to have these generative models, at least in the cases we've seen. To be fair, right? Um, and all, usually the big problem is like you know, if it's very specific data you want to generate the answer from, then you would ra rather need something like a retrieval augmented. Um, retrieval augmented uh, pipeline uh, if this is if this if this is the right reference to this hallucination issue um, I hope I got that right if not let us follow up um, afterwards on on this uh, because I think there are people that deeps it who it, who would probably know also better better assess this in case I missed I missed out on the question now uh, yeah so we have a question from Siva um, Siva is asking a very small question have you used GPT-3 how is that model uh, yes, uh, I think I think uh, I think some folks of us used it. It's available in Haystack um, uh, and on Digital Cloud. Actually, you can you can use it. Um, I think it's good. I think it's a good model. Um, it is. Um, yeah, I think I think it's good. It depends on what you want to use it for. I think yeah, again, um, look, we're we're let, let us say it like this: we are not at all model dogmatic in any sense. We have own models that we train and open source as well. Um, and um, of course, we think the models are good, <laughs> but um, that's pretty much, you know, when you think again about this here, you have to evaluate it. You have to figure it out. It depends on what you want to achieve. Uh, it might be 
that um, G so I think GPT-3 is a good model that like just to say it like I think it's 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 a very good model and there are many applications with it so there's this is what I can say what you want to achieve I don't know if it's the best model you can find um, probably worth trying it out but this is pretty much what this evaluation step comes in you have to try it out you have to elaborate different models you have to see does it work for me doesn't it work for me the end the question is like yeah um, is it is it really serving your use case best and you know it might be that if it is on some specific data, you're better off with, I don't know, a fine tuned, pre fine tuned model. You also have a lot of them, right? BioBird, for example, or things like this. Or if it is, um, I don't know, if it is, if you want a smaller model uh, for some reason, um, then it might be that you go for a distilled option better. You know, this is, these are the considerations. That's simply something to try out, but. GPT-3 is for sure a very good model. Uh, that's that, that for sure. And we know about many users of it. And we know for sure about many people who um, who experimented and iterated over it uh, with Haystack and uh, DeepSet Cloud. Yeah. Awesome. We have another sort of technical question here. Um, how do you handle and monitor model shifts in NLP? Um, and where do you suggest to test first? <laughs> So uh, our opinion is that again, the end user feedback matters. Uh, so um, so uh, I mean, you have different options, of course, to also like identify these drifts. I mean, usually the drift comes from the data, right? So what you what you would need to see is does my data somehow substantially change, or do the requests substantially change that uh, that we have? So you know how comparable is my data index with the data index I had one year before? Yeah, on a maybe on an embedding level to talk now very technical um on an embedding level right you can make a comparison if you feel like oh this is a big discrepancy you should probably challenge uh challenge your application yeah? what we recommend is having a system in place where you continuously make sure that you can track the end user feedback uh, so actually this is a bit the problem in this graphic because here should also be a connection um collect feedback thumbs up thumbs down start to track numbers like uh in which into which result has been clicked yeah um make sure to track maybe even the duration how many how much time do people maybe spend or maybe how many questions of similar kind are asked one after the other really come from the end users i think that's the most reliable source in the end um, and you can enrich it of course you know with drift and with looking about i don't know how the embeddings evolve the, the, the index significantly change um you could even think about kind of like tf idf way of doing it and look like okay did the terminology change substantially over time you know is it critical is it not critical and um, these are all things that can help you and enrich it but first and foremost, you know, what you build with NLP is mostly end user centric applications. Yeah? Uh, someone is really working directly with that input in their day to day work, conversational assistance, whatever. Take their feedback, be sure that you track it continuously. Then you can be sure that, you know, what you've built is, is in line with what is expected and needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another um, technical question from Marlo, it seems. Uh, he says, thanks for the presentation. For NLU tasks like multi-class classification, do you have some experience, do you get some experiences regarding a threshold of minimum or maximum samples per class for mm -hmm. fine tuning? Um, can someone from the DeepSet team uh, make a note? I mean, it would be feel free to send us somehow your mail address we can put you in touch with um yeah with some folks on our site who did this a lot uh I've, i'm sure we have a i'm sure we have someone who can give you an insight here i, I don't have a, a, an answer now to be honest but um that's a i think that's a well-studied problem i think julian Risch or someone from our team can help you here so let's 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 take the note and let's let's uh let's yeah let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's find the connection yeah so that's uh that's not I, I think <laughs> That one I cannot answer confidently. <laughs> okay, then um, there's a question from Lou here. Um, he says, hello, thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, do you have any use cases that use NLP in research institute groups or, or in labs? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, on uh, scientific publications mm -hmm. um, as a search engine, actually, that's... Uh, mm -hmm. That's not an uncommon use case. 
there was even a publication on someone who built with Haystack <laughs> such an application. And the funny thing was that the portal where this paper has been uploaded to was then saying, oh, we're also working right now on capabilities to do exactly this on our platform with Haystack. So this is a thing. And uh, we also know that um, at least in, in, um, in, in pharmaceutical companies, that's the case. And we also work with one company on, on such an engine. Um, and this is this is quite common. So like scientific scientific paper search, research, question answering on it, semantic search. I, I don't know if you want to know what are adverse effects of this and that molecule, and maybe there are different different ways to to name the molecule, or I don't know, maybe maybe different synonyms of it, or maybe then there's the molecular representation, and then there's maybe like the Latin term for it. I'm not an expert, by the way, if I say something stupid, but this is what I what I somehow caught on one ear. Um, then question answering can help you to um, to to you know to overcome this and then to find really all adverse effects in a large paper database. This is a this is a this is a use case we're aware about. Um, also, there um, I know about someone from our team. We can loop you up with if you're interested to learn more. Uh, that would be something for uh, Julian Good. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, maybe we can take one last question here. Um, so the question is like, what's required for the product owner to fully own the product lifecycle? And then what is the role of the data science team in this? Mm -hmm. So what is required is in general, I would say um, a lot of awareness first, awareness and tooling, you know, like tooling makes life easier for sure. Um, first of all, have the awareness about it, you know, understand what, what is possible and understand what to ask for. Uh, um, ask for something that you can try out as a product owner, first and foremost. Don't ask for a model. Ask for, I want something that shows me the functionality. Familiarize yourself with it. Yeah? And then try together with the data scientists to think about, okay, what can we make better, what not? Yeah? The data science role is in the end, this is, I think, important to understand it. Data scientists and machine learning engineers, they work on the model piece, but you need to make sure that, and you need to understand, and this is the second awareness you need as a product owner, you cannot expect or you shouldn't expect them to build your full application just because they are programmers, so to say, right? I mean, software engineering has many facets and nuances and you have experts in many fields and the field of modeling is such a big field already, you know, and picking the model, evaluating properly, then maybe fine tuning it, that this is the job. So I think many product owners often expect that, oh, the guys do the model, they can build a full stack pipeline and maybe they can even create the front end for me, you know, this is not the case. So make sure that, you understand who does what and the data scientist does the modeling part first and foremost and probably will run these evaluations for you and and assess them and come up with the strategies but make sure that the team you have in place is a diverse team so coming back here is a team that you know uh, where are we going where was that sorry <laughs> here you have an application is way more i mean even this representation is too easy but who takes care about the data data upload who takes, takes care about the front end and then who takes care about the model? I think this is very important. Awareness about the capabilities, first and foremost. Awareness about the life cycle. Being sure that the data scientist is a very essential part in the modeling piece, but for the whole application, you will need more resources who are not data scientists or machine learning engineers. And ultimately, of course, having the right tooling in place is always beneficial. That's maybe a finish line and a little bit of marketing on our side. This is pretty much what DeepSet Cloud has been built for. Yeah? Um, to support these processes. But yeah, that's some things I would say. Hope, hope this was helpful. Awesome. I don't I think we'll run out of time now. So um thank you so much everybody who asked questions and everybody who didn't we didn't go get to. We'll try to get to your questions um one to one after this uh, after this webinar is done. So thank yeah. you so much though. Cool. Yeah, so I guess, Milos, we had a few more slides that you wanted to go through. Yes, exactly. So yeah, th so thanks a lot. I I'm super, super happy about the questions. This was this was super cool. I really hope this was useful um, to everyone. I um, really appreciate the questions and, and the interest. Uh, again, if you have a use case, um, please um, scan the code, send it over. Uh, we're happy to to help and assess it. Um, um, I, we talked about 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 our, our, our teams that are working with community and customers. They're very happy to, to give an assessment. So please just feel free to do this. Um, to do this here um leaving it just open for three more seconds because i have another slide so 
hope you took a chance. Uh, if not, we can maybe in the follow-up also send a link around. And then if you are interested from a product manager, actually from our product manager um, and Mattis to learn more about um, really more details about how to ship NLP to production. Uh, so um, if, if you're interested in that, please, um, please join the webinar. Yeah? Here you see the code and the link. We will also send this afterwards. Um, Mattis is responsible for DeepSight Cloud. So he knows a lot about the workflows and everything. Um, and again, it should be an informative, it will be an informative edu educational seminar. Uh, if you are interested in, in how to ship NLP into production, please join. Um, he's, he's uh, I hope, I'm, I'm quite sure it will, if you like this one, it will be at least as informative as this one. And he will be really at least as good in answering questions if you feel like I did a decent job as I am. So it's really worth 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 going on it. Um, and other than that, thank you. Uh, please like, this is our website, visit the GitHub repository, reach out to us in every way that is relevant to you or helpful to you. Um, you know, we, we work on, on bringing NLP to the mainstream, so to say, and, and to, to every company um, in every way we can. And um, if we can help you folks somehow, then just reach out and we're happy to help. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone. That'll, that'll do us for today. And um, yeah, hope you have a good rest of your day and uh, look forward to emails from us about the recording. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.